will be built and to the temple your foundation will be laid. Even though Cyrus was a pagan king, he was the king of a pagan empire, God used him. Isaiah had predicted almost a hundred years before that this would all happen. He also predicts that Cyrus will not last. That Cyrus's cruelty, Cyrus's punishment, Cyrus's unmerciful behavior will not be rewarded just because he was a servant of God. Just because he did what God wanted him to do does not mean that God will reward all of that. God only rewards those who are obedient. Cyrus did much of what he did in spite of himself. Now, I think that it's a miracle that Cyrus did anything at all. But that's not often what we expect. But he certainly wasn't rewarded for that. Listen to what Jeremiah the prophet had to say. And it will come to pass in 70 years that I will punish the king of Babylon and all of that nation, said the Lord, I will punish them for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a perpetual desolation. Cyrus is the most powerful person in the world. When the Medo Persian armies took over much of the known world, it was Cyrus who was at the command and it was Cyrus who was the most feared and the most powerful person on earth at the time. And so for Jeremiah to come out and say, that's all well and good, that's all what you can see, but just know this, in 70 years, none of this is going to be there. In 70 years, I'm going to take Cyrus down as well. It'll be gone. And he does. Pretty amazing that God can speak that far out and let us know And yet, the people had difficulties keeping up. Certainly, we don't have those problems, right? We follow obediently. We follow faithfully. We never lag behind where God is at, or do we? But the people were lagging behind where God was. You see, God gave them a task. They said, I want you to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. I want, you once, I want you to put it back together so that the sacrifices can be offered, so that worship can take place, so that all things can be done orderly. Okay, in Reformed tradition, we should be aware of that, right? Done in good order, good fashion. And the people started out, great guns. They went back, they started putting in the foundation, they got all of the foundation of the temple laid, and then they started getting some opposition. And because of the opposition, they stopped work. They said, this is taking way too long. Maybe what we'll do is we'll just take a break, and we'll go off and build our houses, and then we'll come back to it. The problem is, is they went off and they built their houses, and they built their houses, and they built more houses built more after that, and 16 years later, they haven't gotten back to the temple at all. Now, my question for you is, do you think that God is really interested in the temple, in a building project? I'm not sure that God is really all that interested in having a nice place to live for himself. I think God has an entire universe of places to live. What's the deal with all of that? God wanted their obedience, didn't he? He wanted them to come in worship. He wanted them to be there. He wanted them to once again learn from his word, from his prophets, from his priests, from the ritual, from the sacrifice, from all of the visuals that would be there. And all of that's being neglected. Neglected for what? Well, neglected for their own comfort. They said, we'll build our houses and then we'll come back. Problem is, is when we get distracted, when we lose the first passion that we have in Christ, we often don't get back to it, do we? Has anybody besides me, I'm getting all these blank stares, has anybody besides me ever done that? Maybe it's just me. We get distracted. 
And then God has to call us back. God has to get our attention. I'm real tempted to tell you the story about the, uh, the farmer with the mule. Have you all heard that one? Yeah. Gretchen's going, yeah, don't tell it again. Joyce is saying, no, I haven't heard it. Basically, he encounters this other guy, and, and he says, I've got the smartest mule in the world. He says, I can get him to do anything I want. The guy said, that's amazing. He says, mules aren't known for that. So the very first thing that he does is he gets up, and he picks up a two-by-four, and he whacks the mule on the side of the head. He said, I thought you could get him to do anything you want. He said, yeah, but I've got to get his attention first. Sound familiar? Look at all the things that are going on here. God had to get the people's attention. And then he could get them to do what he wanted. Now, the temple is up. The work is complete. And so the people should rejoice, right? Wrong. You see, there were still people that were there that remembered the old temple. They remembered Solomon's temple. Remember all the descriptions that we went through, all the stories that were there about Solomon's temple and all of the glory, all of the marble, all of the gold, all of the silver, all of the bronze, all of the things that made it a glorious place. And then they looked at the new temple, and it was smaller, and it wasn't as high. And it didn't have as much gold or silver or bronze or cedar wood or all of the things that made the temple glorious, they thought. And so the prophet actually raises this out. Haggai says to them, so any of you around here still old enough to remember the old temple? And I can see now all these hands are going up. Yeah, it was something else. This one, small. what does Haggai do? He doesn't say, well, you know, it's a good start anyway, and God will be pleased. No, he doesn't make any excuses for it at all. What he tells them is that this temple, the smaller temple, the rebuilt temple, will actually have more glory than the previous temple and will last longer. Huh? Why would that be? Does it? Well, if you look strictly at history, you'd say, yeah, I'm not sure. We know it lasts for at least 500 years. The temple doesn't fall down until after the time of Jesus. So what does he mean? It'll have more glory. It wasn't as big. It wasn't as marvelous. It wasn't as beautiful. It wasn't built with as many rich things as Solomon's temple. It certainly didn't have the treasury that Solomon's temple had. So how could it be more glorious? Who went to that temple? Do you remember? Now you've got to skip ahead about 500 years. Is that a clue? That's the temple that Jesus worshipped in, wasn't it? That's the temple where he sat with the elders and marveled them with all of his knowledge of Scripture. That was the temple where he threw out the money changers. That was the temple that surrounded Jesus' life. That was the temple that he warned the Pharisees and scribes that would be demolished, but then raised up again in three days. Oh, wait. That was just an illusion, wasn't it? That temple was him. But out of all of that, more glory came out of the second temple than out of Solomon's. So what does that say for us? Well, it doesn't matter how much gold you've got into it or how much silver or how much cedar wood doesn't matter how much marble floors or countertops or anything else. The glory of God comes from where? From God. It's his presence that brings about the glory of the temple. Not all the things that we put into it. And after all, the things that we put into it, who put those out there so that we could put them into it? God did. 